Revelation 17, Father, we come before you. We thank you for your word. Anytime we read a section of scripture that says, herein is the mind that has wisdom, we find ourselves wondering what exactly we're learning. And so, Lord, as we go through this chapter, again, a powerful chapter, I don't even know how far we're going to get in the chapter today. But I pray, Lord, that your word <clears throat> would open up clearly, simply to every heart that's listening. And then, Lord, there's a lot of information in a few short verses, but the main thing is the main thing. And so I pray, Father God, let all the church have ears to hear, hearts to understand. And if there's any listening today who don't know you, may today be the day that they make a decision. We pray for our country. Lord, we have a judge who is proposed to fill a vacancy. Pray, Father, if that's who you have for the court, that you would get her through the confirmation process. And Lord, you know how we have been praying for revival. Thank you for the people who went to D.C. yesterday. Thank you for the many who came to pray here yesterday. And Lord, we ask that you'd heal our land, bring it back to its sense, bring it back to your feet, that as a country we might be back in our right mind. We ask you to bless your word today, Lord, and strengthen us in our walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> so, chapter 17. Oh, well. Bottle of water if I could, gentlemen, because thank you, Stephen. Appreciate if we have one. See, here's the problem with fall allergies. If you go, <clears throat> everybody goes. <laughs> what? <laughs> so, rather make use of thank you. Appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, the very, very helpful pastor Stephen always tries to hide. Thank God for him. All righty. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore, this false religious system we talked about last week that sitteth upon many waters, which you know if you were here last week or listening in verse 15, those were peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues, a global influence, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and, ha and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-covered beast full of names of blasphemy, that is, the beast was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, and we'll talk about that today. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Now remember, this system John is seeing is a system that rises up when the true church has been removed. And I have an honest question for you that, that hit me afterward. And that is, how, how quiet do you think the true church would be to see a false church rise up and begin to proclaim another person as the Messiah? Do you think the true believers here would remain quiet? Which makes it very hard to promulgate a system like that on the world that's only around, it seems, for the first three and a half years. Because once the Antichrist wants to be God, why need a false system? So it is interesting, again, the fact that this can rise. And we have false Christ. If, if you're checking the headlines, how many remember Jesus in Siberia? Remember him, Vissarion, that guy? He just got arrested. Helicopters, a bunch of guys showed up. Took him. So that's one less. Uh, I've got some news articles, which we can't get to this week. I'll talk to you about them next week, God willing. But how long would the world, the true church, tolerate that? I would like to think they would stand up and, and rise up against it, which is, again, a reminder of it truly does seem the church has been removed, the true believing church, before this false system takes over what is the empty shell. And so the woman was arrayed in purple, scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. And again, this false system leading away from Jesus. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. Now, you remember when John wrote to us and said, Little children, you've heard that Antichrist is going to come. And I say unto you, there are already antichrists. They were of us, but if they were of us, they would have stayed, but they've left, he was talking about. So we have seen some of this over the history of the world, but it will come to its full culmination in this final seven years. 
Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the woman was drunken with the blood of the saints, and we've seen some of that through history, and the blood of the martyrs, which are those of the tribulation of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, <clears throat> Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman, which we did our best to work through last week, first of two subjects, and of the beast that carrieth her. So this false religious system rides on the back of, so to speak, the rising antichrist, which hath seven heads and ten horns. So, verse 8, we pick up the beast, this antichrist, and again we'll show you in a minute. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the abusos or bottomless pit. Everybody got it? And you're thinking, what does that mean? Well, that's, that's why we're not sure how far we're going to get today. Was, is not, shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Let's keep reading in verse 8. And go into perdition, that's apolia, to destroy fully, or the idea of to lose complete loss of well-being is the idea. Into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth. Now, if you've been with us a while, what is that a euphemism for? The unbelievers. And this is our final use of it. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. What were we told twice in this verse about this beast? Was, is not, yet is. Okay, that's the first thing we have to look at. Turn back to Revelation 13. Now, if you're saying, well, we've been here and you've been through this and why go through it? Well, I, I got to tell you that, interestingly enough, a lot of people have tuned in during COVID, number one, because churches have been closed. And then two word got out, we're in the book of Revelation, which apparently not a lot of people go through. And so we've had people jumping in quite a bit along the way here, and they'll say, we're trying to catch up. And also, we're going to review just a tad, just for sake of those who may be brand new to this and wondering what the world is going on. So chapter 13, verse 1 I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Here's again the Antichrist. And upon his horn, ten crowns, and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, leopard Grecian Empire influence. His feet were like the feet of a bear, Medo-Persian influence. His mouth was as the mouth of a lion, Babylonian influence, and the mystery rides on him. And the dragon, the devil from chapter 12, gave him his power and his seat or throne and great authority. Here we go. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed, which means he was, he suffers a deadly wound and it looks like he's not. Now the question is, is he truly dead or only mostly dead? Let's take it into the modern world. What if he is actually dead for a short period of time and then brought back? How many begin to have some lights go? Like, you know, we're now in a world where we can resuscitate people. And it's amazing. Sometimes they have been flatlined for a considerable amount of time and they're able to get them back and praise God, get them back still neurologically intact. So from our perspective, it could be that there's an assassination attempt made against him. He may well be declared dead for a few minutes and then suddenly revived. One way or the other, whether it's a literal death or a false death, the world is going to view it as being genuine. And that may well be part of that strong delusion or deception that will be coming to this world to draw them away from God to the feet of the devil himself and a false Christ. So that's why we had to come back here. I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. His deadly wound was healed. All the world wondered after the beast, the Antichrist. And here's where it's going to take them. And they worshiped the dragon, that is the devil himself from chapter 12, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? I mean, the guy, you can't even kill him. How do you defeat this guy? And there was given unto him again a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Power was given unto him to continue 42 months, the last three and a half years. 
And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. That's where we know it's the last three and a half years because that starts the great tribulation. He declares himself God and he blasphemes the God of gods. Daniel 9, 27, Daniel 11, 36. He opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations and all they that dwell upon the earth. Who's that again? The unbelievers. Whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world shall worship him. If any man has an ear, let him hear. Interesting, go further down though, look at verse 12 of Revelation 13. This false prophet shows up to assist the Antichrist. He exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and he causes the earth and again them that dwell therein, there's that phrase again, to worship the first beast, note this, whose deadly wound was healed. Interesting, he does miracles in verse 13 of Revelation 13. He doeth great wonders, so did he make a fire come down from heaven in the sight of men. Am I the only one hearing this? If we have a pack of dogs run through the building, just, just do the best you can, stand on your chair and don't look them in the eye. And he deceiveth them that dwelleth on the earth. There's that title again. By the means, verse 14, of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, and saying to them that dwell on the earth, there's that title again, that they should make an image to the beast, note this, which had the wound, we just learned something, by a sword, and did live. So what's coming against this Antichrist? We have a term for it, an assassination attempt. And it's an attempt because he survives it. Interesting. Look at Revelation 11, left turn. Verse 7, Revelation 11, 7. This was the two true prophets of God who had been prophesying during the first three and a half years of the tribulation, for those who've been with us, most feel perhaps Moses and Elijah will know when it happens. But when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast, this is the Antichrist, that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. There it is again shall make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. Now you're saying, well, I, can we get any more on this? Yes, there's one Old Testament reference to it. Turn left, Matthew, Malachi, Zechariah. Two books into the Old Testament coming from the right side. Zechariah chapter 11. In Zechariah chapter 11, first we learn of the true shepherd. We learn the true shepherd is sold for 30 pieces of silver. We're told that they will take the funds from that, cast it to the potter, in the house of the Lord, Jesus. But having rejected the true, God then told them, since you've rejected the true, now their judgment for verse 16, lo, Zechariah 11, 16, I will raise up a shepherd in the land which shall not visit those that be cut off, neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that that is broken, nor feed that that standeth still, but shall eat the flesh of the fat and tear their claws in pieces. Rather than care for them, he begins to devour them. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock, the sword, here it is again, shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up, apparently losing the use of it. His right eye shall be utterly darkened. A false coarse shepherd is going to come to Israel. He is going to actually devour them rather than help them. And he is gonna have an attack against them and yet somehow survive. This is the Antichrist. Okay, so back to chapter 17. So the question comes, when? Well, that's awfully hard to know because it's future. I'll give you an opinion which is worth about a bag of beans at Walmart. But an opinion is he signs his peace agreement, which makes it clear he is the Antichrist, which if you've been with us a while, you know, Daniel 9, 27, the way you know the people, the prince that is to come is the prince that is to come is he confirms a covenant for seven years or one week. Then in the middle of it, he cuts off offering and sacrifice. And in Daniel 11, 36, we learn he demands to be worshiped above the God of gods. And he sets himself up as God himself. It seems that my guess, it is after he makes the peace agreement, but before he declares himself to be God. Because again, it's part of that strong delusion and deception. Now, whether it's because he made peace in the Middle East, there are those who are upset, so they make an assassination attempt against him. An interesting thought that some of the 
tribulation authors have tried to do is they've written different stories. Could it be there are those who realizing once the peace agreement's written that this is it, and they try to take him out? I don't know. But he has this attack that comes against him, and the survival of this attack cements the deception to bring the world to his feet. And that's why in chapter 17, verse 8, the beast that you saw was and is not. Somebody tries to kill him. It appears to affect his right arm and one of his eyes. Interestingly enough, yet he survives it. He shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. We don't know how long he's there, but that pit was mentioned to us in Luke 14, Lazarus, or Luke 16, Lazarus and the rich man, and it talks about this place in the center of the earth. Don't know how long he's there, it doesn't define it. But he ascends out of the bottomless pit, and he goeth into apolia, destruction, complete loss of well-being. If you remember 2 Thessalonians 2, we were learning there about the Antichrist, and we learned that the day of God's judgment won't come until there comes a falling away first, and then that lawless one will be revealed, peace agreement, the son of perdition, same word, the one who goes into absolute destruction. But now verse 8, the next part of it. <clears throat> they that dwell on the earth, the unbelievers, shall wonder, okay, here it comes, whose names were not, notice that, not written in the book of life from, the word is apo in the Greek, from the foundation of the world. Names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. There are some people who, when they read God's word, treat the book of Genesis, for example, and the things that are revealed as though when Adam and Eve sinned up in heaven, God went, wait a minute, what did they do? What did they do? Okay, Godhead, quick, divine huddle. What are we gonna do? I don't know, I don't know, what do you think? I don't know. Like it was a surprise. And somehow we're in plan B. And the questions come up like this. So you're telling me God's a God of love. Yeah, absolutely. Don't you know? Well then, he knew Adam and Eve would sin. Yeah, absolutely. Well then, why would he make them in the first place? Because he desires fellowship with man. He doesn't need it, but he desired it. Well, why didn't he just make it so that, you know, couldn't screw up like they did and look at the mess that we're in and everything else? Because how is this a relationship? Why don't you just put a string in our back? I love God. I love, I, I love, right? Without the ability to choose, how can you really have a real relationship with God? So to give man the ability to choose, open the door to man choosing poorly. And they did. I know none of you would have done the same thing, right, if you were there. But he gave him the ability to choose. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So you mean to tell me that God who's sovereign, omniscient, knows everything, knew that Adam and Eve would disobey him? Yep. Knew that they would need a redeemer? Yep. Well, then he caused it. No. Nope. You know what your kids are going to do, especially when they're little? Right? You can see them. They, they come in, you're like, oh, I didn't. Right? Does that mean you caused it? No, but it means as a parent, you have more knowledge than they do. And I'm not, you know, denigrating God's omniscience here. Please understand. But he knew, but yet they chose. You see, this is where Calvin and Arminius have been arguing for 500 years, and nobody's going to solve it till we get to heaven. He has to know, but man gets to choose. You have sovereignty, absolutely, but you have free will. It's throughout the scripture. God so loved the world that whomsoever, what's that? Somebody's choosing. And yet, as we see here, your name has to be in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Note this, they that dwell upon the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. First things first, book of life. We gotta talk about that for a minute. Turn to Exodus 32, book of life. We've been through this before. Yes, we have, but people are joining us, so just be nice and gotta go through it and make sure we know that, hey, this thing is mentioned throughout Old and New Testament. Exodus 32, how many have heard of Moses? Three of you, ooh, remedial church. How many have heard of the golden calf thing? 
Oh, more than Moses, wow. <laughs> Isn't that the way it goes? It's always, oh, wow. Well, the golden calf has happened. Moses has come back up to the Lord in verse 31. He said, Exodus 32, 31, this people have sinned a great sin. They've made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou will forgive their sin, hyphen slash semicolon, pause, pause, crickets, nothing out there. And if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Whoa, he knows of the book. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Now therefore go and lead the people. Woo, okay, so there's the book of life. Psalm 69 on your way back. Psalm 69. We will be in verse 28. Psalm 69. Psalm of David. He's a little upset with those who are giving him grief. He says, for they persecute him whom thou hast smitten. They talk to the grief of those whom thou hast wounded. Verse 27, Psalm 69, add iniquity unto their iniquity. Let them not come into thy righteousness, Psalm 69, 28. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. Whoa, Daniel knows, I mean, uh, David knows about it. Interesting, on your way back, stop at Daniel 12. Daniel 12. This coming to an earth near you. Daniel chapter 12. At that time, verse 1, shall Michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people Israel. There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that same time and at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book and note the outcome of that. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth, verse 2, shall awake. There's a resurrection, Old Testament. Some to everlasting life, those in the book. Some to shame and everlasting contempt. Whoa. Go further, Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. It'll be in verse 17. Luke's gospel. And the 70 returned, you can go home and find out more about that later, with joy again saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. In verse 18, Luke chapter 10, Jesus said unto them, I beheld Satan's lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. What a good encouragement in these days. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Where? The book of life. On your way back, swing by Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Sometimes you just need to see it for yourself. Philippians chapter 4. How many are there already? Ooh, I, I, you, meant, you know how I mention gold stars once in a while? Giving people gold stars. So Wednesday night I came up to teach and there was a big roll of gold stars here with a little, little message on it. So I, I, they're up in my office right now, but I'll break those out for Tuesday morning and then everybody can get gold stars and envy each other and fall into carnality and then we'll have to rebuke them and, and go from there. But Philippians 4, let's stay on target here. So, <clears throat> therefore, my beloved dearly and long for my joy, my crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. For two, I beseech Eudeus and beseech Syntyche that they may be of the same mind. What do you know, even in the early church, they had some differences in the Lord. And I entreat thee also to yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel with Clement also, and with my other fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Interesting. Mentioned in Hebrews 12, mentioned elsewhere, mentioned in Revelation 13, 8, mentioned here in Revelation 17, 8, in Revelation 3, 5, Jesus challenged the church and said, Him that overcometh, I will not blot out his name from the book of life. And lastly, the most important, turn back to chapter 17. Put your finger there and flip over to Revelation 20. I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it. Verse 11. From whose faith, face earth and heaven fled away, there was no place found for them. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. 
And the dead were judged out of these things, or those things which were written in the books according to their works. God knows what you've done. The sea gave up the dead which were in it, the death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. <clears throat> and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire, which again is the second death. People, what book do you want to make sure you're in? How do you get in the book of life? You accept Christ as your Savior. Now, it's interesting also here, note this, back to chapter 17, verse 8. They that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. God has always known. He's always known our need. Well, pastor, here's my problem. Okay, what is it? I don't believe. Yeah, you're right, you got a problem. Yeah. Well, I think it's because my name is not in the book of life, as it says here in chapter 17, verse eight. And since my name's not in the book of life, then I'm gonna be standing there at that great white throne, and when that book's open, I'm not in it, I'm gonna go to the lake of fire, which is the second death, that's not fair. You know, you're right. So I tell you what, you ask Christ to forgive you. You ask him to be your savior. You pray and receive him today into your heart by faith. You will be saved, which means clearly your name is in the book of life and you will be found in that book and have eternal life. Well, I don't want to do that. Well, then maybe you're not in the book. Well, that's not fair. You know, you're right. But I'll tell you what, yeah. sovereignty versus free will. God is omniscient. He knows the end from the beginning. His word tells us that repeatedly. He has to know who will and will not choose him. Well, now here we go, Calvin and Armin. No, no, we're going with scripture. He has to know. We don't, which is why Jesus told us to share the gospel to all nations, telling them the things that he's done, baptizing them in the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Matthew 28. Our job is to share the gospel with everyone, but he has to know or you deny his attribute. But it comes down to you. Eternal life comes down to you. Are you willing to forgive? Are you willing to ask God's forgiveness and to turn from your sin? Now, if you're telling me, well, yeah, that all sounds good, but I don't know how to pray. Okay, well, right on. If that's you this morning, right now, put your hand up. And we'll pray with you right now. We'll lead you in a very simple prayer. Okay, well, we'll see if we get outside. I kind of figured most of you guys inside. Eight o'clock. Hmm. Yeah. Just saying. I've seen more hands going up at funerals. More people realizing things are weird. They need to get right with God. But if you're out there and you're listening on live stream, the prayer is very simple. Lord Jesus, please forgive my sin. I trust you as my savior. I thank you that you've died for me. I ask that you would fill my heart with your Holy Spirit and that my life would change through the power of God. I surrender to you and ask your forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. It's that simple. And then start reading and you'll change. Okay, making sure we cover that. So, they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Now, we can't run away from that yet because we got to talk about the foundation of the world. But you're never going to finish the book. Yes, we will. But right now, go to 1 Peter 1. Well, no, let's do it backwards. Go to 2 Timothy. No, 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 let's do it backwards. 1 Peter 1. I know, it sounds like a bag of cats in my head right now. It's okay. 1 Peter 1. Garage Kitty took down three mice in one day, man. She's on a tear lately. And I feed her. Like, wow. I had a, I had a mouse skin rug on the door when I came in the garage. Flat out, just the one little leg. It was like, gee whiz, she's a taxidermist, too. 1 Peter 1, verse 19. In fact, let's do verse 17. If you call on the Father, who without respect of persons, note that in these days, judges according to every man's work, right? We saw that in chapter 20. Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, empty manner of living, <clears throat> received by the tradition from your fathers. You were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, 
as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained, what does it say? Before. Before he said, let there be light. We're getting to that soon in Genesis. Before the foundation of the world and the counsel of God, Christ was already foreordained to pay for us. Before he ever put into motion the earth and began to rotate it in front of a light source and then sun, moon, and stars show up later. Before he began to create the dry land and the fish in the sea and the birds in the air and human beings and the land animals and all that. Before he did any of this, he knew Adam and Eve would disobey, would sin, and he had already put in plan or in motion in the counsel of God the redemption of this world through Jesus Christ where God would take on human flesh and manifest to this world as God the Son. Before any of it happened, he knew. Which means if you're sitting here and you're like, well, I should have prayed, should have prayed, I should have taken my chance, he knew you'd be here. He knew you'd be tuning in or listening in the car three years later when it's on the radio. We're still here. He knew it. There's nothing that surprises him. Well, then we don't have free will. Oh, no, you've got free will. You can mess up all on your own. But he knows. And that's the thing when you're praying, you're like, Lord, I, I, don't, I don't want to be rebellious. I don't want to go to the left if you want me to go to the right. And I don't want to go to the right if you want me to go to the left or straight. I, I just tell him, I'm, I'm wide open. I'll go whatever way you want. He already knows. And that's why we spend time praying. God, show me your will. I want to be in the midst of that. Not my will, because it's usually painful. Before the foundation of the world. And he was manifest in these last times for you. You who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, amen, that your faith and your hope might be in God. Next one, Titus, left turn from Peter. Titus, again, this fact that this is no surprise to God. We've got to establish that. Titus, chapter 1. You hit Timothy, go back a book. Titus, chapter 1. Paul, of course, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect. There's the idea of him choosing. And according to the truth, which is after godliness. Verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie. Well, is that an encouragement in election season? <laughs> promised when? Before the world began. Last one, 2 Timothy 1. 2 Timothy 1. He said in verse 8 to Timothy, Be not therefore ashamed of the, Lord's test or the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel to the power of God, according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus, given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. He's always known about you. Maybe you thought you were an accident. Maybe you were a chance encounter between two people, or whatever it may be, and, and you always thought, well, you know, I'm just an accident. No, he has always known about you. He has always loved you, and he has worked through your life to call you and draw you to, him, to himself. He does not take any pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. He desires that all would turn, repent, and have life. He created us for fellowship with him. That's mind-blowing. But that's where we're headed, and we're going to get into, in the last few chapters, and yes, we'll get to them, we're going to get into in the last few chapters what he's prepared for us. And in heaven, what we're killing ourselves to obtain here, gold, silver, and everything else, is the sheetrock. The treasure's you. With him. Because you actually believed his, his word. And having believed his word and trusted him for salvation, God is glorified. Because we believed him. So, back to verse 8. Yeah, we've got to get through at least one verse, right? The beast that thou sawest was, is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. We have pretty good confidence he's going to survive some kind of attack against him that will leave him blind in one eye and loss of use of one appendage, probably his right arm again. He will go into perdition. They that dwell in the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Verse 9. Here we go. Here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now, we covered that last week. Add to that chapter 17, verse 18. You'll get further detail. 
And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. At the time this is written, that city is Rome. And as you know, most of you probably, Rome is a city built on seven hills. So the religious system, when the church is removed and the shell gets taken over and is used to bring the world to the feet of the Antichrist, who is going to bring them to the feet of the dragon, it is going to be headquartered in Rome, based on what John is telling us. So here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is. And the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven, and goeth into, here it is again, Apollea, to destroy fully, into perdition. With that, the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Wow. All right. There are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, the other is not yet come. When he cometh, he must continue a short space. No, I, I, I got slides, I got, I got good stuff, but I got two minutes. I'm going to give you a hint, just a hint, Daniel 2, hint, taste, just a hint. Be really I'm not setting a date, but it'd be really convenient if you get raptured so that way, whatever I present, I can't be shown to be wrong for eternity future. You have no idea what it's like. Maybe you do. Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. A head of gold, arms of silver, abdomen of brass, legs of iron, feet partly of iron, partly of clay. Daniel begins to interpret it. <clears throat> if you don't know the story, I encourage you to read it because you'll need it for next week. Daniel says, Thou, O king, verse 37 of Daniel 2, you are a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and he hath made thee a ruler over them all. You, thou, art this head of gold. After thee shall rise another kingdom. Wait a minute. Was Nebuchadnezzar the only king we read of in Babylon in Daniel? No, we have Nebuchadnezzar, even Merodach. We have um, Belshazzar, who has the drunken feast. So he's the head of gold. But there are also other kings. And then look at the next part of the medal here, verse 40, or sorry, verse 39. And after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and it is the Medo-Persians. Cyrus the Persian, Darius the Mede, we talked about him in Haggai because we're now in the last three prophets before the, New, the Old Testament ends on Wednesday night. And so here, even though it's called silver and it's called a kingdom, yet it has two kings as well as subsequent kings that come from it. So sometimes we're talking about a king, and sometimes they're talking about a, come on, kingdom. So here's the mind that has wisdom. There are five kings, seven kings. Five are fallen. One is. The other is not yet come. When he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven, whether it be kings or kingdom. So which is it? We'll find out next week. Let's stand and pray because we don't have enough time. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord, you have warned this world of what is coming. One hundred years ago, the Jews were beginning to come back to the land, but they had no official state. World War I had happened. Europe was in chaos from some of it. Germany got in trouble. 
And then came World War II. And out of the aftermath of the horror of what happened to the Jews, the Roma, and other peoples at the hands of the Nazis, suddenly a nation was born in a day as prophesied in Isaiah 66. And at 4.30 p.m., May 14, 1948, Israel became a state, 3.30 p.m. And suddenly, prophecy began to unfold quickly. Lord, we are on the edge of seeing this eighth, who is of the seven, who was, it is not, it is to come. Thank you that you've warned us. Thank you that we can present these things to the world. And it may be these things will be what draw people to salvation when the church has been suddenly removed and suddenly rises up a false world church system. Lord, give us wisdom and strength. We pray for our country for revival. Thank you for the cool things we're hearing about going on around the country. It would to God it would from spread from coast to coast. And we'd see people come to a true knowledge of Jesus because, Lord, we desire none to perish as you say but all would come to a knowledge of the truth. Thank you for your love for us today. Bless your people as they go. And as they read through these things, Lord, give them a mind that has wisdom that we might understand what is ahead. In Jesus' name, amen.